All right. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for being here. We've got a pretty full house tonight, which is great. Uh, my name is uh, Ben Travers. I serve on the uh, Ward 5 MPA Steering Committee. And, George, uh, one of the reasons we're here tonight uh, is to uh, elect a new steering committee. Uh, but as of right now, uh, we have seven members in our steering committee. Uh, myself, we have Andy Simon here as well, uh, Joey Gary, uh, Joanna Grossman, uh, Muhammad Jafar, uh, we have uh, Alan Bauer uh, as well, who will be here momentarily and will be taking over the uh, moderator duties, um, and uh, Bill Keo, of course, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, tonight, but Bill has um, been uh, a great servant uh, to Burlington uh, over the years, and um, he's among uh, a couple folks on our steering committee who have uh, been serving on it for five years, which is the term limit, and so uh, both Bill and, and Alec have uh, term limited out, but uh, I suspect we'll see Bill around just going to be here tonight, but uh, he's been of great service to the city. Um, we like to begin the meetings uh, with uh, an open forum of sorts, but before we do that, if it's uh, at all possible, we're trying to get better about starting the meetings by just going around quickly and giving everyone sort of an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves, say their name, and, and, uh, and where they live. Uh, we're sort of borderline with a larger crowd here, uh, and, but I think we can do it. So, um, so again, my name's Ben Travers. I live on Home Avenue here in Ward 5, and if we could just start here and go around the room. Hi, I'm John Callow, uh, the Lakeside neighborhood on um, Central Avenue. Carol Bates, um, photographer of Five Sisters. Lisa Nelson, Austin Road. Carrie on Locust Street. Molly Goldman, Chicago Lodge. Andy Simon, Locust Street. Joe Gary, Curtis, and Ash. Joe Shannon, Lakeside. Ashley Dabinsky, Austin Drive. Gordon Jackson, Austin Drive. Shearson Baum, Bender Road. Eric Baum, Bender Road. Emily Pena, Morse Place. Elizabeth Binder, South Cove Road. Brian Davis, Henry Street. Dylan Jacobs, Beale Street. Yeah, Emily, mm -hmm. 1 Avenue. Lucia Campariello, Corner of Pine and Lyman. Joe Jalanella, Lyman Nancy Schwartz, um, off Bridge Parkway on Alder Lane. Marsha Gusterson, Austin Drive. Julie Masuga, Walnut Street, I'm on Parkway. Welcome. Emily Hughes, I live on campus. Great. Betsy Hands, I'm on Caroline Street. Paul Edward, Caroline Street. Joanna Grossman, Lynn Avenue. Michelle Anderson, Cherry Lane. Jim Murdoch, Cherry Lane, Park Club. Mohamed Jafar, Pine Street. Beale St. George, Hayward Street. Hey, Kim Moneyville on Board 7. Scott Pavlik, St. Paul Street. I'm Jennifer. I live on Mansfield Avenue. All right. And, uh, of course, we want to welcome our, our help from CETO, as well as, uh, I, I think we're live streaming uh, on Not yet. Maybe I'm going to call it. Uh, but uh, we're typically live streaming with the uh, help of Channel 17. Hopefully we're recording this. So one way or the other. We have a thumbs up. So one way or another, we'll get the video on this. So, I want to turn it over to Open Forum, but before um, that, I also want to sort of get some papers out to anyone who wants it for um, folks who are interested in, in some of the NPA business we have to do tonight. We have a great agenda, uh, obviously focused on uh, uh, climate change and, and how it's impacting us here in Burlington, but we also have some NPA business to do tonight. And just a couple things I wanted to pass out if you didn't grab them earlier. Um, one is, is that we have this draft. Uh, financing resolution, uh, and we can talk about it more later, but just if folks wanted to uh, have it in hand and take a look. Um, I don't know if I have enough copies for everyone, so if you, uh, if, if you want to just take one and pass them along or, or have one to share, that'd be great. Um, the other is that um, the, the steering committee, as it's composed of right now, um, has made some uh, recommended changes to our bylaws. They haven't been uh, dusted off, and um, I think the last time we did it was I don't know, almost 20 years ago, so if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, people may have picked up a, a copy of this as they walked in. Uh, if you didn't, um, here, and we'll go over a summary of it later, uh, but there's a couple couple additional copies here if anyone wants to take a look and, and pass them around. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have our uh, Sierra Committee elections tonight as well. Uh, and for that, we put out a, a, a voluntary form where folks could uh, submit a statement of interest if they were interested in, in writing this thing. We were really excited uh, about the uh, level of interest that we got. 
Um, it was by no means mandatory, and just because you're not on this list doesn't mean you're not a candidate for the steering committee, but uh, we did have this list uh, available and wanted to give folks an opportunity to uh, take a look at it. So um, I'll pass these around as well if you want to take an opportunity to, uh, to look at that. All right, so uh, now we'll open it up to uh, open forum about issues that uh, aren't on the agenda. If anyone has anything that they want to bring up, you can come forward. Yeah, Carol? Oh, good. I've belonged belong to the Burlington Garden Club for since the 80s, and now they've made me publicity chairman. Um, it means I get to take pictures and do press releases and everything. And every year we do some sort of tour that's part fundraiser and a lot of fun. And this year we're going to go down to Woodstock and see the mansion that the Rockefellers were the last owners of. And they literally walked out, I think, even leaving their toothbrushes. <laughs> uh, and they were known every table you go to, there's a notepad and two sharp pencils. Uh, but anyway, the house is very exciting. There's what they call Belvedere, which is a greenhouse and pool. And then from there, we'll go to Billings Farm Manager's house, which was built in the late 1800s with cutting edge things like central hot water, <laughs> central heat, and a roll top desk. <laughs> but, um, and so we'll be there, and we'll have ice cream, and then we'll go over to Cornish, New Hampshire, which is a little further south and across the bridge to where St. Gaudens is. And he built the Standing Lincoln, which has been copied several times. And in uh, 2016, they got enough money together to actually put one at the gardens where we would go. And his house will be there on tour as well as his studio. And it's all for $95 for the day. And that includes all of your bus and all of your tickets and passes. You bring your own lunch. And I have a lot of flyers here that will tell you something about both places. And we'd love to have you join us. It's June 13th, and we leave at 8 in the morning from Burlington. So I hope you'll come. Burlington Garden Club, it's Burlington, it's Burlington Garden Club. It's bgcbt.org. Uh, there's a Facebook page. We have 300 members, and we get Sometimes a thousand hits, so people love it. Thank right. you so much. Thanks, Carol. And I've got a lot of these if you want them. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else for open forum? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Davis. I'm a transportation planner with the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Um, and I want to talk about a particular project that we're working on in partnership with the City of Burlington on the East Key Avenue. Uh, we started last fall um, trying to take a different concept to have improve the East Key Avenue. And we're studying the whole thing, starting in the north at Riverside Health Center and traveling all the way down to where it ends up in Howard Street and all in Shy Guy and Dr. Um, over the winter, uh, the consulting team has been working on different design concepts. We did some public outreach in the fall. We took all that information, we developed these first drafts. Nothing is set in stone. This is just the first attempt at capturing what we heard from the public. And I wanted to share this with you tonight. Um, let me take a look at those. My name, my uh, project web page is on it, my phone number on there. So take a look at these. Um, it could be a little challenging to decipher on your own. I'm not on each other tonight, but we were much um, work to today. We did a presentation. I'll be presenting it for four, seven next week. And then we have a public meeting just for today for May 8th. And that will be in the Old North End Community Room on Allen Street in the Old North End. Lots of ways to participate. I do want to hear from you. Uh, I have a number of the concepts here that I will leave for you to take. Um, and as well as some little postcards here. Some of the themes that we have heard, uh, there is no connected way if you want to bike to get from the north to the south on Winooski Avenue. As you know, it's residential in the south with some bike facilities. Downtown, which is four lanes of traffic. In the whole north end, there is varying extensive bike facilities. Um, there's on-street parking in some areas, which is important for the local businesses and some of the residents. So we're trying to balance the needs of everyone who wants to use the corridor. Um, and this is your chance to help shape that. So again, this is just draft stuff. 
what's going to happen is for the next step is we'll take all this back and over the next couple months refine these, come back to you late in the summer with some different options that are based on what you'd like and what you think might work, what you don't like and won't work, and we'll take all of that. So I appreciate your time, I appreciate your input. Do get involved in this and be aware it's happening. Tell everyone you know. Um, I also want to let you know another project. Well, first of all, today is the one year anniversary of Green Ride Bike Share. So thanks for your support, if you're a user. Um, the Regional Planning Commission is doing a study of the year one to see how was it? Did it work out? Are stations in the right place? Do we need more of them? Where should they be? Um, as you know, there was a, a pilot station on Flint Ave this summer for a couple months, which was great. Um, and so, to that end, there is an online survey, very short, you know, survey monthly. Uh, there's also a wiki map, an online map where you can go and drop pins. Yes, I would like to see a station here. No, I don't think that station should be there. Identify different biking barriers. Maybe it's a hill, maybe there's not a facility. Um, so we're keeping that open a little bit longer. Um, this study should wrap up in about another month or so, and it will help inform uh, the city's decision on the, the vendor's proposal. So Gotcha Bike is uh, supplying bikes. They have come to the city of Burlington, Lemuski, and South Burlington, where there are stations, with an opportunity to switch the fleet over to electric assist bikes and possibly introduce electric scooters. Again, we want the public feedback on the bikes version, on the potential to introduce scooters, and stations, where would you like to see more stations? Um, so that's very exciting for those of us in the transportation field. Again, all these GC are free to take. My name and contact info is on there, and I encourage you to be in touch with me. Thank you very much. All right, anyone else for open forum? Okay, um, so then we'll move to our agenda. Um, just wanted to, I wanted to know, of course, I wanted to thank our South District City Councilor, John Shannon, for being here. Thanks for helping come to our meeting as a whole. Um, and uh, the other thing is, uh, I, if you haven't signed in already, uh, I'm going to leave the sign-in sheet up here. Uh, and uh, you get a chance on the way out if you could sign in, that'd be great. Um, with that, uh, we have, uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, a great agenda uh, focused on climate change here in Burlington. Um, and uh, our first item on our, our actual agenda here is we're really glad to have Jennifer Green from Burlington Electric to come up and talk about products and climate action. Plan. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, thanks a lot. I really appreciate being invited. Thanks to him. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you know, What's that? You don't really work by. I don't. And I have to say, this not that the DPW um, conference room wasn't a treat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little nicer to be up here in this space. So I haven't actually visited you all. It's, been, it's a guess over years, it's, um, or maybe even two. But anyway, I appreciate being up here. Um, oh, thanks. And somebody looks like he's actually going to move the PowerPoint for me. Thank you. So I think I only got about 15 minutes, and I do apologize that I'm not staying for the panel. Um, my contact information is at the end of these eight slides, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions. And Councilor Shannon, I'm saying now before I forget. If I don't mention the 2030 district and the um, event on May 1st, would you remind me to say something? Since I promised Jenna I would. I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Maybe everybody else can. Yeah, right. So I'm just right, putting it out there. So um, as Ben mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of climate planning in Burlington. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what we know vis-a-vis -vis our greenhouse gas emissions and sort of what we anticipate the trajectory to be. Um, and where we're going, I'm particularly excited to tell you a little bit about our transition to net zero energy um, in case um, folks haven't heard about, for the, I think, kind of the buzz around this, this new theme and topic for us. And I want to talk about the challenges that I, I think we all need to be well aware of when we talk about um, GHG reductions, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, and, and uh, net zero energy in particular, but also the <coughs> opportunities. And, you know, I was thinking about the, that today. I think it's soft, but so important. It may not be tangible, but the fact that we have so much social capital. As I'm listening to Ben, I'm thinking, oh, I know Ben from Leadership Champlain. And I sort of look around the room, and you mentioned the fact that uh, Councillor Shannon was here. I think we cannot underestimate the, the impact um, of the social capital that we share in Burlington. Um, that sort of coupled with our geographic size, I think, really makes anything possible. So um, just quickly, our history, um, and so we're all starting on the same page. Burlington was actually the first city in the country to write a climate action plan. It was written in 2000. 
under Peter Clavel. At that point, there were very few uh, roadmaps or tools to help with quantifying emissions. So if you talk now to the folks that were around and wrote that climate action plan, they talk about how it was like pulling stumps out of the ground. They had nothing to go on, but they, they did take a stab at it. Fast forward to 2007, and there are more tools available. Indeed, cities around the country are now starting to talk about emissions and the roles that they play in um, capturing that data, setting targets, and, in, and then reducing those emissions. So Burlington was very early to get on that bandwagon in terms of using the tools that are, that are now really readily available. So we collected data in 2007, 2010, 2013, more recently, um, 2016. So that's where we are um, from a hist historic standpoint. So um, now can I tell you a little bit about what we know? Which is the second slide, if you don't mind. These are not earth shattering slides, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I have Prezi on my list of things to do, but it hasn't happened yet. So um, our climate action plan essentially talks about eight key themes that we need to address. In the back of the plan, you'll see there are 36 strategies that we need to tackle that are organized around these themes. And as you can imagine, they're focused on transportation, both government and uh, community transportation. So our own city fleet, we have over 270 vehicles in our city fleet, and how you and I and all of us were to get around town. Um, we talk about the importance of energy efficiency in buildings, buildings being a fairly significant portion of our greenhouse gas emissions. We also talk about um, sort of organic matter, i.e. our urban canopy. We, we think it's important that we maintain and build our, our urban canopy from a sequestration standpoint and honor um, sort of our local farms and gardens also from a, a sequestration standpoint. I will mention that waste reduction and, and recycling, it, it seems like you can't have a climate action plan if you're not talking about that. But as you'll see from the pie in a minute, it's actually quite a small sliver of what our total emissions are. So um, I'm going to pull up a, uh, one pie before I do. Um, if you imagine this pie chart and how our emissions are sort of our, our total energy picture is divided up in terms of emissions, can you imagine sort of these themes are sort of churning your brain? what the key sort of what's most responsible for our greenhouse gas emissions in Burlington. We we actually agree and the mayor talk about it quite a lot. Transportation. Yeah, so transportation and it continues to be about the same as much as we can uh, calculate. So from about two thousand and seven up until thirteen is when we have the best data. It continues to be about two hundred and ten thousand metric tons of carbon a year. So what would be the second thing after transportation? Buildings. Yeah, buildings. And we think about buildings, and again, until fairly recently, i.e. 2014, um, the buildings um, are responsible for electricity, of course, and then um, what's our main thermal or heating source in the city? Yes. Yeah, natural gas. Only about 5% of, of residences um, use what we refer to as unregulated fuels, i.e. oil and propane, so most of us heat um, with natural gas. So if you can imagine the pie, it's sort of buildings on one side, slightly less than 50%, which incorporates electricity and natural gas and um, transportation on the other with a little slice for um, waste. So maybe you can look at the next slide. So this is kind of interesting. This is our former, our, this is the pie that I was talking about. Transportation, boom, um, electricity, natural gas, i.e. buildings. Um, this was from 2014, and I wonder if anybody knows why and what changed in 2014. I work for the electric department, that's a hint. <laughs> What's that? Over 100% renewable. Right, wait, we, we, our status changed in the city. We were the first uh, city in the country to source 100% of our electricity from renewables. So this is awesome. Essentially, that means that. If this is our total energy, um, or GHG pi, this is essentially now neutral, bam. So what we're going to need to focus on now going forward is the natural gas component and the transportation component. And I want to talk a little bit about sort of the challenges and opportunities of those two sectors in particular. But 
before then, are there any questions or thoughts or comments on this thus far? I, I guess I just want to question this this electric is because we have a electric burning power plant. It is not exactly neutral. Um, we the way we describe it is sourcing 100% of our electricity from renewables. So the, the and I will say from a GHG emission standpoint. Um, if you use the tools that other cities are using, they tend to consider biomass as, as carbon neutral. So it is, it's, it's debatable, but what I, well, it comes I up. I just want to up. comment that biomass is what you're burning. Mm -hmm. We are burning for yep. our electricity. Yep. And biomass left on the, on the ground and in the trees forms does a lot more in terms of carbon then yeah, I, I just want to mention. Yes. I know you no, know it's this. important. No, it's important to bring that up. And I will maybe as a segue to that, say that we are not um, our city. You and me, we're not um, sourcing wood that is strictly being used for burning and McNeil. We have contracts with over 80, um, most of them small family operations. They're harvesting. Uh, trees mostly for high-end use buildings furniture etc so the scraps that don't have any market value is what um, comes into McNeil and is, and is chipped for the biomass plant so uh, but I but I hear you and this does come up on occasion and I guess you know nothing is exactly. carbon neutral. I think that's and it might be good to mention how many truckloads are burned at the plant every day yes I should can, who can tell me that since I can't right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, this is one of these things when I do the McNeil tour and I often bring students, it's yes. like I gotta lock that one in. So I apologize, but I can get back to folks if it's it's a it's a huge amount that I don't remember either. Okay. But because you because you said we where you source it, yeah. And it seems good. Mm -hmm. But when you hear the amount that mm -hmm. is actually it takes to provide us with our energy, yes. it's um, it is a tremendous amount of biomass that is being burned every day. It's true. And I think um, the segue there, or the, a theme that you're talking about, I think, is efficiency. <clears throat> so anything we do in the city, we really need to think about efficiency first, efficiency first. It's sort of the platform of everything. You know, particularly um, when we talk about adding renewables or um, turning our homes into small microgrids, which is all well and good. Um, really the first thing you want to do is tighten up the envelope and I think you know we can have a long conversation about the and I think we will actually it'll come up in the opportunities and challenges so let's let's move on to, if, if you don't mind hitting the next slide we'll see where we go so um, as I mentioned our first climate plan action plan was written in um, 2010 with 2007 data become carbon uh, or resource 100% of our electricity in 2014, so we have this new status. So it was on that sort of platform that the mayor decided we're gonna to move to the next sort of audacious place, which is to transition the city to net zero energy in the thermal and the transportation sectors. So essentially, um, hello, um, so now that I'm gonna call it clean, oh, clean, now that our grid, our electric grid is clean, we're saying, come to the grid, come back to the grid. <laughs> we want, you know, now the, what we're gonna do is, in theory, begin to transition people out of their um, single combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. We're going to um, incentivize bikes to the extent that we can. And we should also, as a team, you know, Brian was just here, we should really be thinking about the bike walk master plan and ensuring that other alternative forms of transportation are really well supported. Um, that goes for public transit as well. And uh, really working with Green Mountain Transit, really encouraging the electrification of the bus fleet. Um, two electric buses are coming online this summer, and we're looking forward to that, so that's a start. So this is our vision. The vision now, now that we're 100% renewable energy status, or electricity status, we want to invite people back to the grid, and in particular, transition away from fossil fuels in the transportation sector and the heating sector. So maybe before we talk um, for the next few minutes about um, the opportunities, does anybody have a challenge or two in mind that they think might make this, um, and I don't want to be pessimistic, I'm very optimistic, but I think it's also important to sort of 
recognize what, um, what lies ahead in terms of the things that we're going to have to really gather around and group up together to, to do. The landlords and whether they want to put the money into their buildings um, to have their tenants benefit from it. Yeah, so we have a high, I think you have a high rental rate too. Yeah. Or, um, so it's about 60% in Burlington. So oh a lot God. of folks are not responsible for their buildings, but they pay the bills. And because our vacancy rate is so low, we, we really have um, what's referred to as a split incentive. We have property owners who are not incentivized to invest in their buildings because they don't have to because the demand is so high. And then we have um, a lot of tenants who are actually on the move. We have about a 30% turnover rate in the city every year, um, plus this high demand. So this is really um, like the perfect storm of uh, rental properties that need attention. So that's, that's certainly a challenge. Anything else? Yeah. Um, kind of along that note, I just think about the equity lens of how do we go forward with these um, really important measures and not make that an extra burden on people that already have burdens placed upon them. I'm so glad you brought that up because I don't specifically mention it. It is and should be a key theme of everything we do. Not only if you're looking at sort of rental property, but if you're looking at transportation, and really, as you're looking at any sort of innovation that we're going to have to adopt, um, sort of the cities now everywhere are saying, yeah, there's this energy transformation happening, and we cannot leave people behind. So equity has got to be a, a principal theme of everything we do. I mean, this transformation isn't going to work if just rich people are, can afford it. So this is, the, this is kind of the ultimate challenge, I think, and, but also fabulous opportunity as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Is there some way that uh, property taxes could be reduced if um, we get that house up to? Oh, well we can talk about the opportunities. Maybe that would be an opportunity. All right, so hold on to that thought. Are there any other challenges that come to mind that really we need oh, to? I'm sorry. Yeah. I would just say like the grid's capacity in Ooh. Burlington. Yeah. You bring cars on or you're yeah. putting people on meter bumps or whatever. That's yeah. This capacity. Yes. Absolutely. So, and, and um, for those of you that don't know, you know, we have an amazing resource planning team at BED. So if they're really thinking about this all the time, if everyone goes out tomorrow and buys an electric vehicle, do we have the hard, do we have the, the poles and wires, the grid, to support that? So there's a constant uh, sort of balancing act that we anticipate is going to have to happen. And that's actually why we recently released this um, off-peak charging rate for electric vehicles. So we're already starting to think about how we can incentivize folks to um, charge in those off-peak times to help maintain sort of a more consistent demand. So that, that's definitely a challenge. Maybe just one more, yeah. Well, along the equity line, but also the things that you've been talking about, um, getting people out of their cars. Yeah. Um, and one of the big pieces of that is a more efficient uh, public transportation system. Mm -hmm. When Rachel Kennedy was here several mm -hmm. months ago, mm -hmm. um, she made it very clear that they're planning for no increase in funding for public transportation. That seems like a losing proposition if we're mm -hmm. trying to get people out of work. Mm -hmm. That is And electric buses aside, we yeah. have to get people to use the public transit, public yeah. transit and make it for, for people, especially low income people who don't have cars, make it easier to get there. Yes, so the transportation component is going to be big and the public transportation piece is going to have to be an important part of that and how we get to a place where we need it to be is going to be um, a, a heavy and a big lift, particularly what you're hearing from, from Green Mountain Transit. So maybe we can move on to the next. I'm not sure where we are, Joanna, but I think we're about, I know you've got a, your finance conversation. About five minutes. Okay. Um, so this is our net zero energy vision, and I'll just leave you with this in case anybody has any questions. But essentially what we're saying again is we're going to transition off of fossil fuels in the heating sector, i.e. natural gas, and transportation, um, and we're going to look at our, um, our electric grid as an important source to help make that happen. So stay tuned for that. Um, would you mind flipping a slide if you're, if you're able? Thank you. So we covered a, a, bitch, a bunch of these, and um, both from a transportation and from a housing standpoint. 
this is just sort of a quick brain dump um, of, of challenges that I see. To your transportation points, um, about 75% of city employees drive alone to work, which is a little less, but reflects sort of where we are trending in Vermont. As you know, GHG emissions from transportation are also the biggest piece of the, the Vermont pie. Um, Elise mentioned the, the challenges with rental, and again, as I say, 60% are rental. We've got this 1.7% vacancy rate, which the mayor mentioned in his State of the City uh, two weeks ago, which leads us to the split incentive issue, and the turnover rate. Um, we also have old housing stock, and that speaks to the challenge of our the, uh, thermal uh, and the, the shell of our buildings. So um, almost half of our buildings were built before um, 1950. And I think we didn't bring this up, but this is really going to be something we're going to have to rally around. Um, natural gas is cheap, and there's a lot of it. So, again, 95% of us use it um, in our homes. Uh, very, very little commercial um, propane and oil, so they depend on natural gas as well. And it's cheap, and it makes this transition um, to heat pumps. I don't see one in here, but. Um, it makes the transition to heat pump technology um, challenging. So we're going to need to figure out programs by which we can help and incentivize a combination of weatherization plus um, heat pumps. And for those of you that haven't seen the technology, it's, you know, there's a simple, um, uh, it's a piece of hardware in a wall that essentially heats and cools and it's like 98% efficient. So, it's a fabulous technology. They've been using it in Japan for the last 30 years. We're just kind of getting on the bandwagon here. As you know, a lot of our new buildings don't even use gas. A lot of our newer buildings are just going right to heat pump, and that's all fine and good, but again, it's our old housing stock, and we've got a lot of it. So we're gonna have to figure out that one, too. And can I see the last slide, please? I can't honestly remember what's on it. Oh, I think, yeah, so maybe we can end with some things that I think are um, worth some optimism. And it seems so mundane, I think in part because we forget being Burlingtonians, but we own our electric utility. The cities that I work with around the country are just clamoring for energy data. And because most of them have investor-owned utilities or IUCs, they can't get that data. And if you can't measure it, as they say, um, you know, you can't change it. So we're really lucky that we sit on Fabulous data, we know how energy or electricity is being used. And fortunately, we do have, you know, we have a good relationship with Vermont Gas. So uh, we're sitting on really a plethora of information that's going to be helpful to us. Um, BED is also an energy efficiency utility, as you know, one of three in the state. And so that, that uh, line item that you have on your bill, um, you know, goes into this pool, which helps ensure that we can all tap into it as, as necessary for, um, for energy efficiency savings. I would argue, and this kind of gets back to the rental part, is that um, we do have some good policies on the books. I would argue that we maybe want to beef them up. Um, for example, the time of sale. We have a time of sale ordinance in the city. It was written in 1998, and it basically says when you sell your rental property, if your tenant pays the utility bills, you are required, either you or the person buying the unit, of upgrading it. So, I mean, think 1998. So the, what we were saying at the time was you had to invest $1,300, or 3% of the sale price. So we need to update that time of sale so it reflects the current rate of inflation. So we have, again, we've, we've got some good things on the books. We maybe need to beef them up. Um, we have a lot to go on, and we really just sort of need to put the pedal to the metal and make a lot of this happen now. Um, as I mentioned, we do have collaboration with Vermont Gas, and we, you know, as my colleagues at BED remind me, you know, we have to play nicely in the sandbox because until we're at a point where, um, if we, hello, how are you? Um, until we're at a point where our transition is really sort of in full swing and is ready to happen, we, we do depend on natural gas for our heating. Um, I, one nice example of collaboration that happens with Vermont Gas is the Energy Champ Challenge. Um, we're now in phase two, which essentially means that if your building uses more than 50,000 BTUs per square foot of finished space, 
then Vermont Gas and BED will go in together. They'll pay 50% of the weatherization and or energy upgrade costs um, to make a property, to incentivize the property owner to kick it over the line. So we've had, a, I'm going to say, 100, between 165 and 170 buildings that have taken advantage of this, but it's, it's certainly not enough. The threshold to get that money is still a little too high. We want, wouldn't it be nice if it was 25,000 BTUs, yeah. and then you get the money, but right now you have to use a fair amount of natural gas. Um, and then the last thing I'll end, end or leave you with in, um, in our um, quest for net zero <laughs> is the reminder that um, we have tier three money in Burlington, as do all the other utilities that uh, distribute energy. Um, this is through the state renewable energy standards, which sets um, sets sort of the, the, the tier three limits. And to keep it simple, because that's about as, as well as I can describe it, um, BED has funding that allows us to invest in our transition to net zero energy. So this is how we have heat pump rebates, and this is how we have electric vehicle rebates, and this is how we have um, bike electric bike rebates, and this is how we had a tranche of money that we could invest to, to purchase these um, two electric buses. So this is this is really hopeful, and I think um, we're really fortunate to live in a state that that makes that kind of money available to us. So um, thanks very much. I really appreciate being able to to share my thoughts with you tonight. And I, again, I apologize for not staying for the panel, but if anybody did want to reach me, I think on the last slide is my email, which is um, jgreen at burlingtonelectric.com. And I will say that on May 1st, um, there is a, an event down at Main Street Landing. Please, please join us. Burlington has a 2030 district. The whole city is actually a 2030 district. I, I encourage you to Google it. Anybody who signs on, any commercial property owner, and this is all really private sector led, the BED is just here in the wings to help out. But if you're a commercial property owner and um, you, know, you join the district, you're pledging to reduce your GHG from transportation, your building GHG, and, and be better with your water usage. And as part of that membership, um, we're partnering with an energy, um, an engineering team who will come in and essentially draft you up a roadmap for your building. It's all free of charge and an awesome service. So I leave you with that. And if you want to learn more, please come to the May 1st event um, down at Main Street Landing. So thanks, everybody. Thanks again for inviting me. All right. Um, I want to remind okay. people that there are snacks back there. Um, and feel free to get up anytime. Okay. Oh, no. Um, Thanks, Jen. I think we're, uh, we're really lucky to have Rose and Alexa here. So, uh, you're doing really great stuff. Um, so, thank you all for coming. Uh, and you're doing really great stuff. So, as is usually the case, we packed a lot into our agenda. Um, we're going to hope to uh, get it all done within the meantime. As I mentioned, we do have some. Uh, NPA business to turn to. Uh, we may have been a bit optimistic about being able to get to our elections and our financing resolution and our bylaws. If we, had to, if we have to balance our bylaws, we can do that total soon. Um, but uh, I, I want to turn it over to uh, Alan Bauer, who's going to uh, moderate this next session. Um, but before we do that, I, as I mentioned before, um, uh, of the seven people who are currently on the steering committee, uh, we have uh, three who have indicated that they're uh, certainly stepping down. Uh, two of them are stepping down because they've uh, been serving for the last five years and are term limited out. I mentioned Bill Keogh was one of them. Uh, the other is Alec Bauer. Uh, and so I want to say thank you, of course, to Bill and, and Alec for your service. Um, Joanna, as well, uh, has been serving with us for the last couple of years. Joanna's been a real sort of force on the steering committee for driving a lot of uh, really great discussions on a lot of important issues here. And we'll be uh, sorry to lose her on the steering committee. I also just wanted to take a, an, an opportunity to uh, to acknowledge um, someone who's been uh, of great service to here at Ward 5, um, not only here uh, on um, on the steering committee over the years, but also uh, as our uh, 
Board Clerk, and that's uh, Elise Nelson. Um, Elise stepped off uh, last year uh, after serving her five-year term out uh, on the steering committee. And uh, for those four, four folks, uh, we have some tokens of appreciation uh, for your service that we'd like to give you. Uh, so thanks very much for your time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. I want to note that was uh, Elisa's third five-year term. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just, you know, wet behind the ear. Thank you. It's been many years. Okay, we're going to try and catch up here. Uh, again, as Ben noted, uh, my name is Alex Bauer. I know many of you here in the room. I live on Locust Street. I've been a Ward 5 resident ever since the lights went off. <laughs> <Be easy. laughs> so it's that time of year we're going to do, uh, we've got three things on the agenda that are uh, MPA business related and then we're going to get right back to the time of town. Uh, we have steering committee elections, hopefully those will go quickly. Uh, we also have a finance resolution uh, for MPA business that is related to an ongoing effort throughout uh, all of the city's MPAs. Um, we have five of them. Three of them are conjoined two MPAs per, sorry, two wards per MPA for free. Uh, and then there are two individual ward MPAs for five here, of course, and more to six up the hill. Um, so that finance resolution is uh, related to a push to fund MPAs a little bit more than they have been funded in the past. Uh, many, I don't think all yet, maybe all but one, have already uh, voted as MPAs um, to send a resolution from the MPA to the city council. Uh, requesting these additional funds. So we'll talk about that in a minute, and then if we need to punt on anything, it'll be bylaws. Uh, your Ward 5 steering committee uh, over the last month or six weeks has, uh, I wouldn't say rewritten our uh, bylaws. Bylaws are always available, by the way, on the city website. Uh, we have revised them extensively, though. They were last uh, revised on Elisa's second five-year term on the NPA. Uh, I promise last time I'll say that. Um, so they were 17 years old uh, since they've been revised last. So there were some things in there that were either outdated, incorrect, or just inappropriate for, way, for the way the MPA functions here in Burlington in 2019 moving forward. Uh, so we've taken great effort to revise those accordingly. Um, I'll say candidly, um, on behalf of all of us who voted unanimously on the steering committee to put forth these bylaws as, as we're putting them forth, um, there's no great shakes in there. They're predominantly the same. It's a nip and tuck here and there. We cut out some sections we thought were uh, redundant, superfluous, or otherwise already picked up in the NPA charter. So those are the three things we're going to try and get done in the next, uh, what do we have, up until 7.40, so we have 20 minutes, let's see what we can do. Um, so elections first, we have seven openings on the steering committee. We have a sheet here with eight folks who are interested, uh, who have submitted a statement of interest to the MPA through a website that uh, Ben set up on, uh, on Google, so I, I think many of you probably had a chance to review this a little bit. We're going to give an opportunity for, uh, for each of the folks on here to give a one minute pitch, yeah. or somewhere around there. So I'm just going to go down the line because this is how they're on the list, so, oh wait, they're alphabetical, is that unfair to A's? I should know that. They're alphabetical by first name. By first name. Um, are there any objections going out on the list? All right, so, A and Simon's first. Keep it, keep it brief so we can stay on time. My name is Amy Simon. Um, I served one year on the steering committee, and I really believe in MPAs. I think that um, we have a lot of potential, as, uh, as I said in my little write-up, this is how meeting democracy for Burlington. And I think that um, we, we've just begun to explore the, the, the real possibilities for MPAs, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to serve. Thank you. And Ashley? Hi, um, I'm Ashley Dundinsky. I've been coming to the Ward 5 MPAs for about four years since I moved to the South End. Um, I really like what they do. I think it's cool that we have kind of a community space that really talks about things that are important specifically to us and also a way to kind of hear about things in the bigger city and bring it home and talk about it. Um, I'd like to just kind of help out and help keep it organized and keep it moving. Thank you. Mr. Travis? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Ben, um, had the unfair advantage of being up here already, but uh, I've served on the NPA steering committee for the last couple of years. It's been a real honor and privilege to use this opportunity to uh, not only myself stay tuned into our city issues, but also provide, uh, I think, a, a friendly neutral forum for folks of 
uh, really all stripes to feel comfortable to come in and to uh, hear what folks have to say on the issues of import, uh, as well as to voice their own opinions. Um, I think we've done a lot of good stuff uh, as an MPA over the last couple of years. We've moved to this great location. Uh, we've started live streaming our meetings on Channel 17. Uh, I think what I'd like for us to continue doing is to uh, increase our efforts to broaden these meetings to a, a, a bigger scope of people. We've talked about, uh, for example, um, trying to have some talking over food type events uh, as they do in some other wards. We've talked about uh, perhaps um, even bringing in child care services for some of these meetings. Um, so that's what I would like to focus on in addition to what we've uh, uh, been doing here. I'd like to continue doing that. So I appreciate your support. Thanks. And then, Jeff? Oh, Jay. I'm Joe Day, incumbent. Uh, I've been on the steering committee for one year and I've just been excited by the energy that we've seen around a lot of different issues uh, over that time and looking forward to continuing. Um, I think we have done a little bit of improvement on our technology use and you know we have a lot of people in the room tonight that's actually really really great um, but you know we're trying to bring it to more and more people that would you know there's probably uh, many many more hundred people in the board that could participate either um, at this time or any time afterward during the month so appreciate your support thanks joe Catherine. Do we have a Captain Regal? No. Okay. Uh, Katie, is that right? Uh, okay. Uh, Kristen? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Kirsten Bohm, which starts with a K. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that's confusing on your balance. It's, uh, it's a Swedish pronunciation of the name Kirsten. Um, live in here in Ward 5, obviously, been here for about four years. Um, we, my husband and I, have found the um, NPA meetings really helpful in terms of just understanding uh, community issues, getting different perspectives. We found them particularly helpful in advance of elections in the past, hearing from different candidates and on ballot issues. Um, we're, I'm at the point in kind of my community engagement where I want to give back and be part of that. Uh, Especially, um, we have two sons, uh, four and one, and kind of setting that example of that level of engagement for them. And I think bringing that perspective as um, a woman and a mom to thinking about the agendas that we have here and the conversations and the perspectives that we bring um, here. Um, I think uh, also echoing uh, Ben's statement about wanting to just support, um, you know, increased engagement and the work that the MPA has been doing to, to engage uh, more families and make the opportunity more more accessible to folks. Um, and also just wanted to say, like, this is so exciting that there are, there's more interest, you know, in the steering committee than there are seats. I think that that would be the envy of a lot of the crowd here tonight. Um, Lucia? Lucia? Hi, um, so I'm Lucia Pantarello. Um, I just want to say I'm thrilled to be here tonight, um, and I so appreciate the opportunity to participate in tonight's elections. Um, I view this as an opportunity to more deeply engage in my hyper local community, which is both really exciting and also super important. Um, since relocating to Vermont about four years ago now, we really built our lives um, in a very tight radius uh, within this neighborhood. Our two children are across the street um, over at Pine Forest Children's Center. Um, our older daughter will begin at kindergarten at Champlain Elementary next year. Our younger daughter will turn two in a couple of months. My husband Joe is here and works in town, and professionally I'm a fundraiser um, at an organization that is headquartered in Burlington. Um, so really, um, really excited about the opportunity to give back uh, to my community, and if I were to highlight one skill that I think makes me uh, particularly suited for this role, it's my ability to um, build and maintain really great relationships. So obviously a skill that uh, is required of me in my profession, hopefully my husband would attest to this being an effective skill in our personal lives. Um, and I think a really important skill for uh, both the ability to work with a committee of people as well as individually um, with community members and neighbors. So really appreciate being here and um, for your vote my way. Thanks. Thank you. Scott? Sure. 
everybody. I'm Scott Pavic. I think I spoke at the last one or the one before. I hope you're not sick of me yet because I'm interested in being part of the steering committee. Um, I've only lived in the South Ends for a little over two and a half years. We're, no, we're in year three now, so relatively new compared to some of you, but my fiance and I, um, since coming there, have decided to build our life in Burlington. The South End sold us, it was mainly Shy Guy Gelato. But a lot of our neighborhood is really great. Um, I'm particularly interested in creating connections and conversations, promoting community engagement, something that I've done throughout my roles at UVM as a graduate student and employee and during my time in AmeriCorps. Um, just learning about the issues that we face as a city it seems apparent that we really need to be promoting participation widely. It seems like we've done quite a good job tonight, um, but I would like to uh, help move that momentum forward. So, thanks. Great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, anybody else uh, who uh, is not on the sheet? Or that the same? Yeah, sure. um, I'm Muhammad Jafar. Uh, I just joined the steering committee actually last year, so I've been on for the past year. Um, I joined because I think it's really, really important, much like everyone else has kind of echoed. Um, we don't, there aren't many cities in which things like this, functions like this happen, so that people are able to have these discussions that are really, really important. So I got involved in someone who's come from across the world in Kenya. Um, I want to get involved and kind of bring whatever perspective that I may have to the table to help kind of mitigate a lot of the issues that we all face. So I'm Muhammad and I've been here for a year. Hope you'll uh, keep me for a year longer. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mohammed. So again, we have uh, nine folks. Is there anybody else who's uh, interested who hasn't uh, made a statement of interest? Um, okay. Um, unless there are objections, I think by virtue of having submitted a statement or standing up in front of the room and making a statement of interest, I'd like to nominate the set the nine people who are uh, who have uh, stated interest already. Second, but... All right. <laughs> uh, no, there are seven seats. So oh. there are nine applicants. There are seven seats. We do have ballots, uh, and we have our uh, our ward clerk here who's going to help. Wait, Alec, right. but one of the people who submitted a statement isn't here. So we have eight. eight. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can vote for someone in in absentia. Uh, if there are folks here who would like to vote for Katie, is that right, Andy? Katie. Uh, that's. That's totally fine. We can't proxy vote. Um, oh, I got gotcha. But they did, uh, she did submit a statement of interest. Okay. And um, keep going. So <laughs> we have ballots in the back. What we're going to do is uh, you write down the seven names uh, that you would like to vote for, up to seven. You don't have to put all seven down. Um, up to seven. And uh, our um, election <laughs> official is going to help tally while we move on to the next part. Or two assistant election officials. We do have two. Four. In addition, we have a former steering committee member for five and Boda. I love my ballot. Oh, it's, it's a parallelogram. So we thought that putting down the names of the folks that uh, you wanted to vote for was better than picking the two that you didn't want. <laughs> It means more right, everybody. I want to make sure you know why. Residents can vote. That's right. I just wanted to That's right. Thank you, Joanna. Only Ward 5 residents. I know you have some visitors, which is awesome. These are extra people to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I could use about her. Her name or last name? Yeah. No staffing the ballot box. I'll take three of those. Yeah, so I have an extra ballot. Okay. 
diverse group of neighbors, and including including but not limited to providing meals and child food. So that's basically what the additional money is for, is for yeah, we, meals and child care? I can speak on behalf of the steering committee, certainly not other MPAs that have voted for this. Uh, in the past, in the five years that I've been on the steering committee, we have a $400 annual allocation, um, which, to be totally candid, we don't often spend. Uh, in part because 400 bucks is not enough to put together a community dinner but once, let alone uh, let alone four times a year, five times a year, whatever, whatever else it might be. Um, one round of signs for lawn signs to promote uh, the MPA meetings is going to run us 400 bucks. So, or, or, or close to it, somewhere in that vicinity. So there, there's a fair number of things that we have discussed as a steering committee that we would want to throw some MPA weight behind. A uh, joint event with local motion to do bike safety in the Champlain Elementary Park lot, for example. There's some money there for cleanup, there's some money for rented equipment, for generators and things like that. Many of which we've just not really gone down the road to seriously consider because the $400 annual allocation isn't, isn't much. So aside from putting together uh, more accessibility, more, uh, more technology available, more marketing, more more of everything that we're already doing to expand and further deepen the engagement of the community that the MPA is here to provide. Uh, that's where the that's where the funding allocation came from. Um, I think that's probably pretty similar to what some of the other MPAs have said, what I certainly read from their minutes. Um, I don't know how much that differs or how much that allays your concerns or not. Um, but that's where the steering committee came from. I, I I just think it's helpful because it's a it's a budget consideration and so it's up against other budget considerations and other things that mm -hmm. that need to be cut in order to get more, you know, every year budgets get tighter and tighter in order to give more money to something else, you're taking it from something because the pie's not getting bigger. So I just think that that's an important thing to, to keep in mind because all of those things are good things. They're, they're just competing with other good things. It's, it's the thing to keep in mind. So the more Understood. specificity we have about how the money is going to be used, that can make it easier to you know, evaluate in that yeah. environment. I don't think that, um, I don't know that we necessarily have a specific proposal for that, but um, speaking for myself, I don't think it'd be out of line for this resolution if it were to go forward. For those who don't understand how MPA resolutions work, uh, if we all approve this resolution as an MPA, it gets given over to the City Council. They're only required to respond to it. Uh, there's no statutory or legislative teeth to a resolution from the MPA. It just goes to them. We have to get a response from them. I imagine the response from the City Council will likely be, what are you going to use the money for? And at some point, we would probably, as, an, as a ward MPA, need to put together a short list of things that we want. In the meantime, though, this push has come from uh, a citywide MPA push to try and get some additional funding in for the next budgetary cycle. So there's probably a little bit of time before the city council would make a final vote on whether or not we're going to get the funds. Approving this doesn't automatically mean we're going to get the funds. It means we're going to let city council know we want them, and they'll say, uh, is, they'll say yeah or nay. Is it possible that the city council could respond, have a thousand or something? We're not tied to the 2,500? Totally, yes. Uh, the city, the, they could come back and say, how about a thousand for the first year, or how about the full funding for this first year, but we're going to renegotiate. We want a full audit after the first year. What do you use money for? Material benefits, all that's possible. Or maybe we should be asking for that. I mean, like, I mean, and John served on the uh, has ha served on city council for a long time. Do 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 you think if we do do you think do you think if we asked for asked for for, for less money that we would have a better chance? Rather than because because it does seem like a large increase from what we were before. So maybe I think maybe. probably a plan gives you a better chance than uh -huh. mm -hmm. than the dollar amount because as I said then we can better evaluate what we're taking money from and is this you know is this better than that so the more specificity you have on how you're spending it the easier it is to make that I don't think that there's an objection actually to the dollar amount being requested sure um, but it's also not um, it's not like if we don't get this dollar amount, we can't do this very important thing that we wanted to do. It's a little bit more global yeah. what you want to do. We want to do more of all of these things. Yeah, it's so not. we'll do less. We'll do a little bit more, not as much more if we get less. So I think, and also I think that the council would come back if you ask for this amount, and the council says, well, we can't give you that. 
we can give you a lower amount. I, I don't think that the answer is likely to be no based on the dollar amount. Mm -hmm. It's more based on the plan. Because if, you know, we could still offer a thousand instead of 2,500. Yeah, I think the, the distinction that some of the MPAs and we on the steering committee have certainly discussed here is that the, the enhanced funding for the MPAs is more, administrative is the wrong word, but it's more of an ongoing operations kind of funding. It's not, because the MPA does a lot of different things. Or uh, we have our hand, our sort of um, hands in the conversation around a lot of different topics, which we could throw a little bit more weight towards marketing, whether it's a mayoral caucus or, a, or an election event that we would maybe want a table for and, and have certain handouts or whatever it may be to help push that uh, engagement. It may not, you know, and if it comes back from the city council that we need a specific plan, well then we as a community, as a group, need to assess what we want to put in that plan or in that appeal. I have a question that neither of you may have the answer to in this very moment, but let's say we do ask for the amount that we're asking for and we're able to kind of navigate what exactly we're going to use it for. We're going to have to do that every year because it seems tough to kind of, you know, each year's different dictate what you're going to do yeah. next year. I think that's, that's, what, that's kind of what I was getting at, it being more operational, but um, if there are folks who feel really that it should be, you know, that the money for the MPAs is not necessarily a good use of funds that could otherwise be better served uh, elsewhere in the city than vote against the resolution. Um, it's uh, it sounds good. I can respond to Please. Uh, you know, once you get something in the budget, it's easier to keep it in the budget than it is to get it in the budget. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily <clears throat> have to be doing that every year, except that it could, of course, also be cut from the, like, if you're finding out, you know, you, we're not using the funds that we have available today, and now we're asking for more money and those funds don't get used, we're probably not going to continue to put it in the budget. Yeah. Although the funds don't come to the MPA in perpetuity, they don't come to the MPA and we keep them in a bank account and it rolls over. Uh, if we don't spend the money, we, we don't actually get money in advance from the city. Uh, we have a $400 <coughs> allocation. And when we spend money on snacks, when we spend money on signage, when we spend money on flyers for an event that we're working on, uh, we as individuals, we pay for that, and then we re get reimbursed by the city as part of that $400 allocation. So if the allocation was a not to exceed of $2,500 annually, it'd be the same situation. We, the money would still be in the city coffers if we don't use it. Um, yeah, context on that. I think I just have a comment, and that is that um, a resolution of this type, I think, prioritizes citizen engagement. And in Burlington, our NPAs is an instituted way that citizens can participate in what's going on, have a discussion, and that um, the only other ways are to go individually at public, uh, for public comment times. This is where we can actually discuss with our neighbors the issues. So for me, prioritizing um, maximum engagement, and if the NPA has said, the steering committee has said they need they could do more, and they have a vision of how they could do more um, by promoting, uh, in terms of promoting citizen engagement. That all right? Then let's do it. Let's let's find those ways to promote how how many people are here, and how many people know about what's going on in the city, and how many people understand what the issues are. And this is where we find out. Yeah. Okay. Can I just as, you know, watching uh, tonight a dad carry his screaming kids out of the meeting, I, I would say that at least one of our number one priorities is to um, think of a space and, uh, and think of qualified child caregivers who could create a situation where, where parents could actually participate in the meeting and not have to have that tension all the time. Uh, about home life, about bringing children into, um, into the space and uh, be able to continue to be part of Any other uh, questions, comments, concerns? No? I'd move to pass the resolution. Any second? Any second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, resolution passes. Nice job, NPA. Yay, thank you. Um, so we're out of time, unfortunately. I don't think we're going to get to the bylaws. Um,
I'm going to ask you one time, does anybody feel like they would vote for the bylaws uh, without a pro without a full-on discussion? I know you've had a chance to read them. If there's any concerns <coughs> that you just want to read through and have a longer, uh, more uh, thorough discussion on the changes to the bylaws, then we should punt to next month. If folks have read through and don't have much of a concern, then we could consider uh, moving to vote on that now. Um, I had some concern with the resolutions section. Um, because I've seen resolutions be effective, and then I've also seen, you know, people when they're kind of organically grown out of the NPA. I, I'm not sure that a yes/no vote on things is the greatest value of the NPA. I think what's really of greatest value is the back and forth and and public comment, rather than a whole bunch of people showing up here who have never shown up here just for the purpose of voting yes or no on something. Um, and that, that's a new piece of the bylaws. And in it, it says you know, that this is like, it has a wording that says something like this is one of the most effective things that, that the MPA can do. And I'm not. Not new, though, I don't think, John. Um, and well, is it? No. We changed some of the parameters around it. It was a, it was a topic of yeah. discussion, but um, you know, and I want folks to feel like they have an opportunity to yeah. discuss these issues fully. So, what's another month when it's been? Yeah, we should now. Uh, so, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, so I'm going to turn over. Sorry, before we do, uh, we we probably have some election results, which is great. Um, we'll hear that, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tony Grossman, who's going to help uh, moderate this last portion of the. Uh, Lisa? Uh, so the best thing to me is that we had such a great group of people and the one of the big times wow, wonderful. <laughs> um, so um, the people who are been elected to the Ward 5 MPA steering committee are Andy, Ashley, Ben, Shearston, Lucia, Muhammad, and Scott. Congratulations. Awesome. Hey, congratulations, everybody, and thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, it's just awesome. And, uh, this is kind of fun because this is my last meeting on the steering committees, and this climate change themed uh, meeting was my idea, and I'm like so happy you're all here and you all care about climate change. Um, so anyway, I'd love for our panel to step up. And by the way, there should be a couple of seats around for folks standing if you want to snag them. Senate and I served for eight years in 
uh, in the House prior to that. Um, my committee assignments are um, actually the vice chair of the Senate Ag Committee, which is a new role for me for being on that committee, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And I also serve on the Finance Committee, which deals with taxes, but also regulates utilities um, and insurance people, so we have a broad um, assignment, you could say. Thanks for having us. Great to be back. Uh, my name is Julie Masuga. I'm the Extreme Energy Field Organizer for 350 Vermont, which is a nonprofit that works on issues of climate justice. Um, unlike Burlington Electric, they're talking about you know playing nicely in the sandbox with utilities like Vermont Gas. I'm sort of on the other end of this spectrum. I'd rather them not be in the sandbox at all. Um, my my purview <laughs> is really around. Uh, by, my role is around fossil fuel resistance, so um, mostly around pipelines, um, decommissioning them, and preventing them from going to the ground in the first place. And I'd like to briefly plug an event. I work really closely with Mary on a couple of bills uh, that would prevent the build out of any new fossil, large scale fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. And there's actually a public hearing on Tuesday at the State House that, you know, Mary will be there. Will you be there, Chris? I'll be at the State House. One, one time. One time. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but yeah. Um, um, so uh, yeah, people are welcome to. We were pushing for people to attend and potentially to give a two-minute testimony on why um, these particular bills really need to pass. Because uh, I think you know we've had a lot of things in Burlington like advisory ballot items on plastic items, which are great and are necessary, but not really commensurate with the scale of the climate crisis we're in. And nothing short of getting off of fossil fuels is going to get us there. So. Um, if you're interested in that, please come find me. Julie, can you say the date again? It is uh, Tuesday the 23rd from 5 to 7 with the sign up starting at 4.15 and State House Room 11. Yeah. Great. Hi, my name is Sandra O'Flaherty. Um, I am the, uh, the group leader for the Burlington chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby is a national and international organization and we uh, work on um, helping empower people to exercise their own political power and um, finding bipartisan solutions to climate change. Um, our, our main uh, laser focus is, is what we call a carbon fee and dividend, which is putting a price on carbon, um, putting a price on fossil fuels at the source, and then using that revenue and rebating it in households to help households um, you know, make the transition. Um, so we are super excited. We, uh, the group started in 2007. Our Burlington chapter started in, five years ago. Um, and I say Burlington, but it's really the greater Burlington area. We have people, a guy from South Hero, we have people from um, all over Chittenden County. Um, and we're really excited because we just had the first bipartisan climate change bill introduced in Congress um, this session, which is very exciting. Um, and it's, we find that it's, it's really due to volunteers from Citizens Climate Lobby. We go to Washington, we meet with every single congressional office, we work with whoever's in office, it doesn't matter you know, if they're extreme right or extreme left or somewhere in the middle, um, to talk about our legislative proposal. And the, the name of the actual bill which has been introduced is called the um, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. I can talk more about, but um, you know, it's all about helping people um, not feel hopeless and realize that they have some power, and, and you know, carbon pricing is a huge part of any solution. So, um, so thank you guys for introducing yourselves. They're all amazing. Um, so, I have a few prompts that I wanted to throw at you guys, and then I was hoping that um, our guests would have a couple questions too. So I guess um, I, you know, I've always tried to live a moderate, not always, but like I don't know, the past like 15 years, try to live a moderately sustainable life. But I, um, I hope that a lot of you have seen the video, a TED talk that a young activist in Sweden made. Uh, her name is Greta Thunberg, mm -hmm. and she is amazing. And when I saw it like a couple months ago, I think I had this sort of like climate awakening. And I was like, oh my god, I need to be talking about climate change like every second of my life. Like I have a daughter, like this is our future, it's really important. And so I really am like kind of like at the fire. And so I'm kind of wondering if you guys can tell me, I, I wonder if we could talk first about staying local and then your opinion about national. 
um, initiatives that people can get behind, you know, what's, what's moving in, at the state level and at the local level, and then next round we'll talk about the national level. Is it, I don't want to like, yeah, let's go on the same I just, um, I want to start by, I think we're all very excited that um, the governor signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement um, back, I think, in the fall. Um, when you do things like that, there are goals, and you're supposed to embrace the goals along with just talking about them. So Energy um, Independent Vermont created this chart, and if we were going to meet the Paris climate goals by 2025, um, these green bars are where we ought to get to. The budget that the governor sent over, this is the amount that um, where he would have gotten this tiny, tiny little part where he um, included uh, 1.5 million for the, um, of money um, to electrify um, transportation. Uh, that's not going to get us where we um, want to go. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot happening in the building. Um, I always get uh, a little nervous that it starts happening, but it doesn't get to fruition. And um, it's important for everybody to know how much pressure there is inside the building. The fuel dealers walk around with their lobbyists, and there's all those um, those people, and they talk and whatever. And the um, you know the business associations talk to all of their members, and their members talk to all of um, the members of the legislature. Um, but you know, regular citizens tend not to just have a lobbyist there, you know, who can say, right now you need to call your legislator and hound them about this. So. I really encourage people to hound, 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 hound the governor, hound all the legislators, and uh, just really keep after us. Um, I will uh, not hog all the time now, but I'll uh, come back to say what some of the things are that are happening in the House, some of the really good bills um, that I'm hoping to really see movement on. Um, but in the meantime, I do walk around with a low level of anxiety thinking about climate change all the time, and it's scary. Oh, well, that's <coughs> me too. Um, I, uh, I graduated from UVM in 95, and uh, my girlfriend at the time was an environmental studies major. I was a psychology major, and I learned a lot about the climate crisis then. Um, and it was not on everybody's mind, and it, it uh, but it, it inspired me. I was waiting tables and trying to figure out how to earn a living. And, and work on these issues, and I ended up finding myself working for Bernie Sanders uh, as a change agent, and eventually being in the legislature, sort of all motivated from these issues, and it's uh, enormously scary that it's taken so long, and I will say somewhat hopeful that there is an incredible focus. It is still not the paramount focus that it has to be. Um, but um, if you could, you know, we don't have many climate deniers in Montpelier, I will say that. We have varying degrees of how much money and how much urgency we're willing to put on there. Um, a couple of things that uh, you may not have heard about, I'm very pleased to say that uh, uh, a bill to ban HFCs, this is coolants that uh, run in the air conditioning in this building probably, and after the Montreal meeting where we banned CFCs because of the ozone, the industry shifted to HFCs. Well, it turns out when these leak, they're uh, uh, greenhouse gas pollution about a thousand times the potency of carbon. Um, and Obama, the Obama administration banned them, and the industry was shifting away from them, and a court uh, challenged that, or, or it was challenging court, the ruling, the, the judge, in fact, uh, won, Mr. Brett Kavanaugh, uh, overturned that ruling before he was on the Supreme Court. And the Trump administration then walked away. So you had a case where the industry was ready to do it, and then the regs moved away. Several states came on board, um, California, I think, leading the way, Connecticut, Rhode Island. So, so somebody approached me, we put in a bill, it passed the Senate, um, and it's in the House side now. This is, this is a good one. Uh, the governor actually, to his credit, is trying to work with other governors to do it together in unison with them. And they said, oh, you're passing this bill, we're working on this. I said, well, we're gonna keep passing the bill, you keep working. Uh, obviously, it'd be great to have several governors join together, but I'm not uh, ready to take the 
uh, pressure off of our governor, not always uh, out in front of this stuff. Um, in the Ag Committee, so I was on Natural Resources two, the last two years, uh, and we found ourselves fighting with Ag uh, quite a bit. And that's a historic challenge. <laughs> and when it comes to water quality, that's a really destructive challenge. And so they shook up both committees, and I found myself sitting on the Ag Committee. It's been a wonderful challenge. I'm learning a lot. Um, and of course, these have a ton to do with climate change. What could be better for a sustainable future than local food, right? So we are wrestling with how do you get more local food, in particular, into our schools. You've got to go through unbelievable hoops at the federal level. They pay for a whole lot of our school lunches. Uh, but we are pushing and pushing and pushing on doing that. And actually, Burlington should be very proud of, of leading the effort 20 years ago Every piece of beef served in Burlington schools comes from Madison County now. Um, and, and Burlington was way out in front, and oh, what are those hippies in Burlington doing? And now this is pervasive all over the state, and what I've been saying and others are trying to push on, hey, we don't need to have the greatest food director in a particular school move heaven and earth to get this going. We need to have state systems that makes this really easy. So a lot of the food going into schools is delivered on a Reinhardt truck. Right? We've seen them driving around those big box trucks. Just today, we're talking about people to figure out, how, rather than the food director figuring out how to scrape together pennies and the state throws in a few pennies to get local food in, can't some people from the Agency of Ed and the Agency of Ag deal with Reinhardt's? We give them millions of dollars in our, in our food school food contracts. You know, these are kinds of system changes that we're looking at. We'll move on, but there's one more I want to talk about, um, and in water quality, we have not come up with funding yet. There, I believe we will do that this year. We haven't spent it yet. What we haven't done is said, this is how we're going to raise the money for years to come. We've been spending a lot more money in the last several years, but we haven't found a dedicated source. Um, ag plays an incredible role in water quality, and it's a similar role in um, carbon sinks, actually. If we have healthy soils, those dusty fields don't run off when the rain comes and when the floods come. And we're getting about nine inches more rain than we used to be getting. The Northeast <coughs> is getting particularly wet, you may have noticed. Um, so we have to build soil. When you build soil, we're more flood resistant. You sequester more carbon. You can handle big rain events. You are polluting, you have less runoff. So we're trying to figure out how to you know, we've increased uh, requirements, we've put requirements on farmers, they're called the required agricultural practices, that gets us here. But when they want to go here, is there a way to measure this increase in soil health in particular and pay farmers for that? We're going to spend a lot of money cleaning up water. We should get some of this money to farmers who are, after all, uh, control three quarters of our open lands controlled by dairy farmers. Uh, we got to get this right. This is not going to be easy, but we, the Senate passed that, the House has passed something, the bills are crisscrossing, but we're looking at these kinds of conversations. In that bill, also, we started looking at putting Vermont forests into um, carbon markets. So California has cap and trade, right? They need to pay people to keep land forested to absorb carbon. If we do this and we get money into forest owners, we're not reducing carbon, so we should not pat ourselves on the back. This is, this is allowing them to pollute, and they pay us so that they can keep polluting. So that's not in its, of itself a good thing, except for their requirements get tighter every year. What is good is that we have a lot of forest land, and it's, generating, it's, it's shifting generations as we're aging, and that puts a lot of pressure on those forests to be developed. And that's a loser for us in every way. Uh, habitat protection, carbon suppression, all of this. So, so we've asked for a pilot for the state to put its own land in these if it's possible, and then next, after we figure that out, help landowners, private landowners, aggregate and get themselves into these markets. So just some little things that probably have been below the radar, not making headlines, but uh, to give you an idea of some of the energy and, and effort that we're, we're pushing.
Um, 350 Vermont has been really focused on two bills in particular, um, H51, which Mary introduced, which would put a ban on any new large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure projects in the state, so basically no more pipelines, um, even if y'all are, if there's any climate deniers in here, please see me after class, but, um, <laughs> you know, even the, our newest infrastructure, Vermont Gas's ANGP pipeline extension, which goes um, from Colchester down to Middlebury is under investigation for nine categories of alleged safety and construction violations, so, and it might get shut down as a result. So even if we're not thinking climate-wise, these pipeline, this pipeline is unsafe. So trying to stop building these things further is really crucial. So there's that bill, and then there is um, Mari Cordes' bill. Um, she's a rep out of Addison County, H-175, which would ban the use of eminent domain to build any new fossil fuel projects. Eminent domain basically meaning that utilities like Vermont Gas can condemn people's land in order to build fossil fuel projects. And um, it's and they, they do claim that they never had to use eminent domain for their last pipeline extension, which is true, but it's, it's not really the eminent domain being used, it's the threat of eminent domain. People can't keep up with the legal fees. Um, and uh, if you come on Tuesday, you'll be able to hear some landowners who ended up just having to move. It was too traumatizing for them and their families um, to continue to fight these legal battles. So um, two really important bills we're trying to push for at this hearing on Tuesday. Um, yeah, so that's sort of what we're doing at the state level and then at the municipal level. Um, my colleague Jael works on these climate solutions resolutions, which I'm fairly certain Burlington passed one, but 55 towns in Vermont have now had um, advisory um, resolutions that say we don't want to build any more fossil fuel infrastructure in our town. So that's roughly a third of Vermont town, or a fifth of Vermont towns have now said we don't want to have any more fossil fuel build out. And the fossil fuel build out that we are seeing, you know, this latest pipeline serves roughly 3,000 customers at a cost of $165 million, which potentially is going to be a stranded asset. So the costs don't even make sense. So um, these are the, I'm, I'm again, highly focused on um, fossil fuel infrastructure, but all these other bills, uh, there's a lot of really important ones out there. We're also in support of uh, Representative Brian Gina's zero waste study bill, which is trying to get Vermont to be 90%, um, you know, reusing things and not and creating less waste, um, using less plastic, all those kinds of things, but really hammering in on nothing less than stopping our consumption of fossil fuel is really acceptable. Um, so the citizens' climate lobby, we're a little bit different because we are laser focused on that carbon pricing um, and, and at the national level specifically, but we, we certainly have um, tried to support state efforts for carbon pricing. Um, and I think one of our, our main you know, ways that we try to empower citizens is, is to remind you all that you can be lobbyists too. You know, when I go on Capitol Hill and I'm talking with Peter Welch's staffers or, you know, other staffers from around the country, um, you know, they're listening to us and, and we have a lot of information and, you know, a lot of times politicians are responding to political will, they're not creating it. And so we need to speak up. And so, um, you know, with Citizens Climate Lobby, we, we try to organize, you know, we encourage people to write letters to the editor, whether it's on a state carbon pricing proposal or, or a national, um, you know, national newspaper. Um, and also, uh, up in Grand Isle County, I started the Grand Isle Climate Action Team. And there was just a handful of us, and we would get together, and we would write letters to our reps. We would write to Mitzi Johnson, Speaker of the House, and um, Ben Joseph, and now it's, it's changed this year. Um, and just say, hey, we're here. We're in Grand Isle County. We really care about climate, and we want you to start talking about it. And, and it worked, you know. Um, Mitzi was about to do uh, an interview on VPR. She called me first to tell her what she was, what she was going to say. It wasn't exactly what I wanted her to say, but it wasn't surprising <laughs> either. So, you know, just the fact that even as an ordinary citizen, you can form relationships with our politicians, you can influence them, um, and just remembering that you have power. And so, just you know, get some neighbors together. And, and write about what you want. Talk, talk with people. You know, a lot of, maybe less so in Burlington, but a lot of people are just kind of afraid to talk about climate change. It's depressing, it's dark, it's doom and gloom, you know, and so making it part of an everyday conversation 
and talking about solutions so that there is hope and positive energy, not just, you know, we're, we're really doomed, so, you know, what are we going to do now? You know, just go cry or something. But, um, <laughs> you know, just remembering that, that we as citizens have power. Sandra, I think you're a really good pivot. Do you want to talk a little about what the Citizens Climate Lobby is pushing on the national level? And then yeah, down sure. And talk about that. Um, so like I said earlier, it's the um, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which is quite a mouthful. Um, and it's, um, so it was, it was introduced in the House and Senate at the end of last, um, you know, back in November. And it was reintroduced in the House um, in February, but they've um, yet to be reintroduced in the Senate. Um, it's bipartisan, which is key. You know, we recognize that we really have to, that's what we need. And so um, it takes the legislative proposal that Citizens Climate Lobby has been advocating for, for you know, over 10 years, and it actually working with Republican and Democrat offices um, in the Capitol um, actually negotiated the bill, which is very strongly what Citizens Climate Lobby has been advocating all the time. So just to give you some of the basics of the bill is it puts a price on carbon at the source, so the well, the mine, the port of entry, um, and it starts at $15 per metric ton, and then every year it increases by $10 per ton, which sends a predictable price signal to the industry and to consumers that it's time to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and then a really key part of the policy is that it um, refunds all the money that's collected minus, you know, a, a very small administrative portion, I think one percent or so, um, to households, and it's it's on an equal basis um, for two adults per household and um, an unlimited number of children. It used to be two children per household, and then in negotiations it became unlimited. Um, and uh, it, because it is trying to be bipartisan and bring everybody on board, um, it does. Um, Start. Um, so there is, um, actually I should back up and start, there's also a, um, a border adjustment. So countries that do not have a similar carbon pricing program would pay a tariff. Um, and then on U.S. Uh, exports that do, uh, you know, exporting to countries who would get a rebate to help keep um, American businesses competitive, even with countries who don't have a price on carbon. Um, so, by you know by refunding the money to households, it helps people adjust to you know price increases because in the market you know it's it's bound to happen that prices will go up. Um, but there are plenty of studies showing that um, two thirds of households will actually benefit from this refund or this rebate, and um, even among the you know the higher income people who tend to use more fossil fuels. Um, they do lose, but they lose small, which is important, you know, in building um, support for the bill. Um, so I don't know what how, how deep we want to go into. It. We do have a website if you want to explore more of the details. But um, it shows that after the first 10 years, it would reduce emissions by a third, and after 20 years, it would reduce it by half. And um, there is built into the policy that. Um, we can reassess every five years to see how we're doing on our goals. And if we're not meeting our goals, we can up the annual increase to $15 per metric ton, up from the 10. Um, and also, once again, as a, a compromise to make it bipartisan, it does um, put a pause on the EPA's ability to regulate um, greenhouse gases only for their greenhouse gas potential. This is so it's not having a you know what they call a double jeopardy. You're not taxing the same thing twice, um, but you know the EPA can still regulate um, greenhouse gases for health Im impacts, um, which is really important for environmental justice. You know where you have um, you know gases um, you know concentrated, and um, I just think it's a really elegant and transparent way to, to quickly address emissions. We know it's not the end-all, be-all policy, um, but, you know, <coughs> climate change is a huge market failure. 
you know, we've used the atmosphere as an open <coughs> dumping system. And um, by putting a price on carbon, you're correcting for that externality. And so it will really help set the stage for, um, you know, the other, the other policies that have happened. Um, there was just an article in the New York Times that said, um, you know, if we could, if we could implement uh, carbon pricing along with the Green New Deal, we would really be on fire, you know, because um, it just, it, it helps speed up the transition that needs to happen already. You know, you, you talk to your neighbor and they say, well, you know, I'd really like to get a heat pump, but they're so expensive, you know, and, and it starts to lay that economic foundation where you realize, hey, you know, the fossil fuels, because they're finally reflecting their true cost, they are getting more and more expensive. So, um, there's you know over 3,000 economists who support um, carbon pricing, and, and specifically with giving the rebate back to households, um, so that it's not regressive, and so that you know average people can can make it work. So that's it's a it's a lot, but um, I'm happy to take questions later. And, cool. Yeah, yeah, let's let's go through the row. We can talk about national stuff, and then I'd love to get some questions from you. Yeah. Um, so 350 Vermont, you know Vermont's the name, we're pretty Vermont-centric in a lot of what we do, but in terms of national policy, we're, we do a little bit of support for Green New Deal and things like that, um, but our, our concerns nationally are, again, um, at least in my work, centered around pipeline expansion. Um, the Keystone XL, um, is cur there's currently an injunction on it, which is great, but Trump is trying to reissue permits so that could be um, completed. So um, if that is the case, and then if indigenous leaders call on us to send people down there to have to try to stop the tail end of the so-called black snake, the end of Dakota Access or the Keystone XL, we um, are supporting that work and sending folks down there to prevent that from going into the ground. So there's that piece, and then um, you know, talking about uh, in Vermont, we're not, you know, a coastal state, we're not really, you know, farmers are really feeling the impact of climate change and ski resorts and things like that, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we're not always seeing it, not always feeling it, but um, trying to think more broadly and regionally of, like, where is our fracked gas coming from? Who does that impact? So our fracked gas that's coming through, at least through the pipeline system, is coming from uh, a hub near Toronto and mostly from uh, from Alberta, from Lubicon Creek First Nations territory, where they're suffering from low birth weight, cancer, tuberculosis, etc. Um, at you know for our benefit because we're the ones getting this fracked gas. And then you talk about you know the primary component of fracked gas being methane, which is 86 times more potent over a 20-year period than carbon is. So in many ways, it's it's much worse than carbon. So the industry often argues, oh well, it has less of a carbon footprint, which is true, but the methane footprint is really, really um, terrible. And so these effects aren't usually. It's easy to sort of be Vermont centric, to be Burlington centric, and to live in our little bubble, but. You have countries like Bangladesh that are literally sinking into the ocean and trying to really think about that justice component where the folks who are contributing the least to climate change are suffering the most. And so how can we, as Burlington or as Vermont or as a region, um, really take responsibility for what's happening globally? So really trying to think of where are we sourcing our energy? Or even, you know, Burlington talks a lot about being 100%, um, you know, net zero or whatever, I'm forgetting the exact term, but, you know, we're getting a lot of our electricity from Hydro-Quebec, and how is Hydro-Quebec and their mega dams up, again, with a, with another um, indigenous tribe in Canada, the James Bakery, what is happening to their land um, due to this dam, which is, you know, probably creating methane swamps, and again, it's an environmental justice component, so really trying to get past the greenwashing that's happening, and just one more note on greenwashing. Uh, some folks have probably heard about Vermont Gas's Renewable Natural Gas Program. It's a complete farce, I'm sorry, but um, let's pretend for a minute that sourcing our energy from waste and manure is a good idea, and relying on waste is a good idea. Let's pretend for a moment that that's okay. Um, between less than 1% and less than 5% of their total system consumption is going to come from these quote-unquote renewable sources. And to me, that's like telling a cancer patient, I've cured less than 5% of your cancer, but you're going to be fine. 
Our cancer patient does not have 10 years for you to figure it out, and there's no way we're ever going to get to 100% renewable natural gas. So I just want to plant that set seed in people's minds that this is a greenwashing scheme and this is not a solution. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're working on. But Chris and Mary, I don't know if this question applies to you guys, but if you have thoughts on national bills or initiatives, we'd be happy to hear well, not specific bills, but I would say um, we really badly need national leadership. I, I have often thought that one of our best roles in Vermont is to try things out and be a demonstration project. And we have done that. Uh, Efficiency Vermont is probably the, the most straightforward example, which was founded uh, at around 2000 as a product of the legislature and, and local folks again here in Burlington, it's now a knowledge um, export that part of Efficiency Vermont staff goes around the world to helping other people create an efficiency utility. Uh, that was a novel idea. We, we really need national leadership because you know Mary and I have proposed bills to put a price on carbon and um, we're, we're close to a lot of borders uh, in this state, and that is always going to be tricky. You're not going to really, really reduce our carbon footprint if you have cheap gas. There's no getting around that. And it's a hard economic argument to make when you're only able to impact uh, very coarse and uh, narrow, <laughs> narrow state. So we've got to have leadership on uh, the federal level, um, and we haven't really seen that. Even in the Obama era, there were some positive steps, but it was pretty uh, underwhelming, and let's hope that we can turn that around. Um, um, we desperately, desperately need um, leadership at the national level. Uh, in the meantime, I've heard arguments that, like, well, what can Vermont do because our emissions are so small? And um, the fact is we are a small state, so uh, we are going to take care of our own emissions, not everybody else's, and that's what everybody needs to do. So um, I think that is a cognitively ridiculous argument. Um, but the, the carbon pricing is something that we have worked on, and with this talk about something, I've never seen anything like it, where the um, misinformation campaigns about carbon pricing have gotten people, you know, we have the yellow vesters show up at the state house, you know, you're not going to, you know, they're so angry about this one issue. Um, and it's the one that just makes the most sense. We always, when we're looking for new pro funding for new programs, we look at what the program does with water and whatever. What's a nexus? Well, the nexus here clearly is, you know, when you pollute with carbon, then you put money in a pot to reduce carbon. That um, is just the fairest way of approaching it. Um, so um, hopefully things do change around at the national level because I think it's a really scary thought if they don't. Um, but in the meantime, we really are doing some things um, in Vermont. And um, there's a bill that was introduced that I'm very excited about. It's called the Global Warming Solutions Act. It's introduced by um, Sarah Copeland Hansis from um, Bradford and Selena Colbert with um, uh, several um, from Burlington with several co-sponsors. And what it would do is take um, these goals that we have that we you know talk about and so excited about and actually put them into law. And then you as citizens would be allowed to sue the state if they don't um, abide by these and set up programs to achieve them. Massachusetts introduced it about 10 years ago. Um, and until the lawsuit happened, um, they weren't really creating a program to reduce their carbons. Once they were sued, all of a sudden it went into place and they really started with carbon reductions. Um, I think that's what we need here. Can I get some questions from the panel from you all? Yeah, hi. Um, I have two, if that's okay, but I'm going to stop at one. Uh, I, I hear a lot of things about mitigating the climate problems that are coming, but I rarely hear anything about anticipating the fact that it's basically inevitable at this point. Uh, is there anything going on that's trying to anticipate the problems that are going to come with climate change at this point? Things like 
I don't know if Vermont is part of where the polar vortex is going to hit. It's going to get colder, heating costs will go up. If it's not, our ski season is going to be less, or our tourism numbers are going to be down. Is there going to be anything? I imagine we'll probably get more migrants or immigrants in the near future because we have some friends that live in Texas and it's basically unbearable now. I just, I rarely hear anything talking about handling ways, <coughs> anticipating it definitely happening. Um, I, I can give you a small example. Um, in the climate caucus, so so we all, were, in the legislature, you work on one or two committees and say you have two, in the House you have one, and things are very bifurcated by committee, you're on the Judiciary Committee, you're on the Transportation Committee, you're on the Education Committee. And the Climate Caucus was an attempt by some of us to bring people together and say, okay, you know what, this impacts the folks on ag, and it impacts our tax policy, and it impacts our, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, there was a, a woman who um, represents South Burlington, made of Townsend. She, she was very new. She said, well, I'm on government operations. What, 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 what do I do? And, and, Luckily, I have been worrying about kind of your question of what do we do if, you know, Hurricane Sandy, which was pretty rugged around the New York City area, was really, really rugged, right? And it wasn't like move out for two weeks and then come back. Vermont has, we have public safety protocols for outbreaks, for disasters, natural disasters. And so that they government operations deals with that. So she dutifully went and asked the commissioner of public safety, "Do we have a plan for when 100,000 people show up?" <laughs> and this guy was probably like very surprised by this question. Well, now we have a plan. You know, so that this is not oh, good. life altering, but somewhere there is a protocol now in state government that kind of anticipates this. This is a, a this is not enough, right? But it's a small example. Um, Culverts, when we were a lot, were destroyed in Irene. We, and Peter Shulman deserves a lot of credit for this. FEMA says, you can build them back. And we were like, well, it's stupid to have this big culverts. You know, we're entering a pretty predictable wet season. And so he really, uh, somehow, they got the federal government to, to pay for increased culverts. It's not exciting stuff, but, <laughs> but it is the foundation of adaptation. Absolutely. Yeah. I just have to follow up on the culvert and sort of the flooding issues in our state since they're so prominent right now. I keep getting Vermont digger alerts for flooding across the state. And <coughs> there are these small groups uh, that are working on um, riparian restoration, right sizing culverts, they're watershed based. And yet the state policymakers are struggling with how to integrate the groups that are on the ground, the boots on the ground, to actually who are doing the planning and thinking and outreach and engagement to make those projects possible to have funding. And I find it really challenging to think about how if we have all this federal funding coming in, but we have no people in those towns ready or anticipating or talking about how does the state think that those culverts will get put into place because they're done by those groups. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Um, um, I, I have some ideas, um, and, it, and it's a real balancing act. I mean, uh, when you look at Lake Champlain, and that, that we're in an agreement with the federal government, right? We've been sued, we have a legal agreement to deal. Uh, that onus falls on the state. Um, but the work and the solutions on the ground were very dependent on local partners. Um, and even even like road projects and stuff are coordinated locally by our regional planning commissions. Um, so in the last several years, we've been trying to figure out how to, where the state is collecting the money. Some of it's federal, some of it's our own tax dollars. We're trying to push it out into the region for all sorts of projects, small and big. Um, and we uncovered that. There was an organization, I'm going to forget their, their name, that was writing like hundreds of grants. They had a base fund of $100,000, and they were literally writing 
hundreds of grants, tiny grants, and they would take that hundred grand of their base funding and through all this grant writing, all to the state, get a budget of like two million dollars. And, and we were like, this cannot be happening. So we started the process of a block grant situation so that that group can write one grant or five grants, I don't know, but not a hundred grants, right? And so we're trying to, and, and remember the water quality sphere, and it relates to a lot of these issues because there's a good intersection of climate and water. This is a, we recognize this is many decades here. So we're in year three maybe of trying to better organize ourselves and make sure that folks on the ground uh, who, who have plans, who know where the best bang for our buck is, um, can get the money, get it efficiently, but the state has to be accountable, and that, so that's tricky. And you also have to watch out for, you don't want the best grant writers to get the money, because actually you want the money to go to where you're gonna have the best impact on water quality, and that might be a tiny town with you know, a town manager and a road manager, and that's it. And they don't have, you know, CEDO has dozens of grant writers. We, so that, those are some of the balances. But there is a strong commitment and an understanding that local underground partners are vital to this, and and we are trying to make that uh, more straightforward, more easy to nav navigate, and predictable. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, one of the other things that haunts me is, you know, there's an ag sector for water quality, there's transportation, and then there's developed land, and we worked really hard in the last couple of years to make sure all of those were at least understanding what each other was doing. So we can't have the, the road people fixing a road uh, next summer, this summer, and then the ag people have that same, some kind of fix on the field right there that they're gonna get to in five years. Like, that's idiotic. When that happens, we gotta put that into one and have our work crew there and fix it all at once. You know what I mean? So, so, <laughs> It's yeah, sometimes yeah. depressing how straightforward that would seem and how state government is not quite there yet, but we are forcing those uh, coordinated efforts as part of the larger work, I think. We're well, I did want to make one pitch on that, which is there's a conference coming up at Norwich University on June 7th, and it's the Resilient Vermont Network uh, conference, and they do bring together ag, energy, food, energy, and water. It's probably one of the only kind of conferences where you see that kind of intersection, and I think often it's hard to attract people because they only see themselves in the asylum. So we're hoping that folks from the legislature come and be great. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add last uh, year and the year before when I saw the natural resources, we had a lot of the groups come in from around the, um, the state along with the regional planning commissions. Um, the wealth of activism and knowledge and activity that's going on in the state is unbelievable. And there are a lot of projects that are um, being proposed out there that have been well studied and researched and you know, they're kind of ready to go, which is why I'm really hoping that we get that really good um, source of funding to uh, for water. And when we you know talk about water, that is so interrelated to the resilience um, that we need um, to combat climate because um, we know that these uh, intense storms that come down are related to to uh, to climate, and they um, you know just um, take so much of our um, the, the soils and whatever with them when they uh, push down so far into the lakes and the rivers. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I work for the city of South Burlington and I would do a lot with our stormwater utility and I'm excited. I know that it's not moving fast, but I'm still hoping that the state will do something statewide along those lines, those pervious services. Joanna? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Can I just say, I just, I just want to say that I want to thank our panelists a lot for taking the time to come. Um, it's really easy to get overwhelmed on climate issues because it's just so urgent and it's, it's so profound, it affects all of us. But I want to say that one of the things that um, seems like a bottom line to me on resilience, adaptation, and taking action together is community. That the way we're gonna, we're gonna um, survive, or if we do survive, but is, is by building community. And that's on a local level as well on a regional level and a national level. So I just want to um, 
thank you all for coming out tonight because this is part of it for me is getting to know your neighbors, being able to talk about issues, um, and, and being able to depend on each other. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Go ahead. Um, I uh, hear you. There's all these things happening at the state level, and the national level, and even some on the community level. But I want the single household level where I boots on my ground, I've gotten rid of all my grass, and I'm collecting the storm water from my drains, and it's going down into the ground. But Ruby Perry and Andy Simon have, I think, contributed the most with the way they plan their house, that we need some individual things we can do. We can also put in a whole bunch of plants that um, will help to absorb the water, help the bees, help the, the birds, help the insects in your garden based on the plants that you just put in. Those are very simple things. They don't cost a bazillion dollars. And like in our neighborhood, we have a whole big plant exchange. Um, the Burlington Garden Club that I belong to is $35 a year, and the lectures that we have are really pretty phenomenal. One of them just said, you know, leave your garden at the end. Don't trash it. Let it sit there for the birds and bees and the insects all winter. And I just find that I, I, you got bills, so tell me you want me to support those bills, but I need individual people. All Caroline Street could get together and we could ditch our bloody sidewalks so that the water runs off the sidewalks and into the ground, and we saved our sidewalks. And that's something very simple that a neighborhood could do, and that's the information I want. And if you have to redo your driveway, we did this a couple of years ago. Um, we have um, a driveway that absorbs the water. Um, yeah. And about an hour after the people left who were building it, we had this like, super flash flood. And I was out there just amazed that none of the water was running off. Um, it's it's work. just a super way to do it. Well, yeah. Who's your point on the carbon that you said you have information or knowledge or whatever that says that? Raising the price fifteen dollars a ton and then twenty five a year is going to do less and such in terms of getting rid of it. And I hear you hundred percent. My concern is that we had that in a you know, natural form, in the form of you know, the price of gas price of gas, let's say five years ago or something. It was up pretty steep for a while, but it went up quicker, let's put it that way. And people actually started to change their ways. Mm -hmm. It took a year or so that people started buying smaller cars, getting mm -hmm. the drugs and going, Oh my god, it cost too much money. Mm -hmm. And then they turned around like that. And the price went back down. They immediately responded. And I think they've gone farther. Um, there are much more big SUVs and so on than there ever have been. Um, so my question is, how do you know the stuff you say you know? And how are we going to get people to actually act accordingly in the longer term? Um, well, the, the study that was done was done by the Regional Economic Modeling Group. And they looked at the um, I can't remember the methodology um, at this moment, but um, you know, it's, it's a complicated model that that's running for short that they developed. Um, um, and because people do respond to price increase, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's it using well, the market. Oh, the only thing I wanted to add is I've asked a few economists: Is it true that people respond more to? a tax price then low than just a cost. And the reason they do is because they're sure that's permanent, where they don't know if the, um, the price of the pump is just going to go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> and the gas tax really has not kept pace with what it was intended to do. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and that's by design. And so, um, which is why in the transportation sector, you know, they talk about, well, maybe we should try to get vehicle miles traveled instead. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to get people to sign up to say yes, charging even more. Um, which is why, you know, if, if you're putting this fee on the producers at at the source of production, um, they're the ones paying the fee. And yes, they are going to pass it on through the market, through the price of goods that you're buying. And and just like you know, when gas goes high, you know, people drive less. And it's because it's that steady, predictable market signal. You know, it's it's. Ten dollars, you know, fifteen dollars the first year, twenty-five the next, thirty-five. And some economists, I read an article and it said that in order to start really seeing um, 
like clear effects, you've got to get at and above $40, $40 per metric ton. So even with the CCL policy, you know, year one is 15, it's going to take a couple years to ramp up to that to that $40 mark, but that's when, you know, the, the, the price changes are enough um, that it starts. My concern is that, that, that yeah. we as a community, to, to Carol's point, so we are really aren't this. We aren't really accepting this is true and making it happen to all of us, not just our car or truck. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, well, we're trying to, I guess I had a really small car, cost me that much for the gas pump. Gas mm -hmm. But when it comes back to all, I'm happy to it back to that. Point. And they don't even see that that actually applies to uh, their house, their, their electricity, their lights, all the different things. They all apply the same way. Uh, hopefully, you know, the, the carbon portion in Burlington wouldn't go up. Would affect the electric charge. Right, you know, you, it, but. you have, you can have, you have like um, BEV and biofuel and things, but um, just, you know, because you're, um, uh, for instance, the, the Obama Clean Power Plant, you know, it was putting that price, but it was only affecting the electric side. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, with the CCL policy, because you're putting it on all fossil fuels as a source, it's going to be a lot more. And so you're going to see quicker and um, more significant reductions. And, and you're right, you know, if, if we enact the policy and then, you know, the administration changes and then it gets, you know, taken away or reduced, you're right. It's, it, you know, you need a, a stable, predictable policy to get the result that you want. Um, and the other thing, along with um, the reports I've read, showed that carbon pricing um, not only is a signal to stop using it so much, but also then you have this extra money that you then hopefully use to incentivize programs like the electrification of transportation and weatherizing homes and doing these other things that we really need to do. Electric SUVs doesn't help. You need a small car. Yeah. Well, three people. They were so I just want to thank you all. I've got to kind of cut it off here. We're a little over already. I just asked you, what's the bill number in the house? And is the bill supporting it? Uh, it is. Well, so I'm just pulling that up. I just okay. say, um, I'll follow up with you all and get bill numbers and post them on the okay. NBA Facebook group. And uh, I'll, so I'll tweet them out and Joey and the Lee and stuff. Yes, we yeah, so, And you can also go to cplusa.org slash bill and you'll see it. It's a little fund where you'll see, you know, where the bills of what's in there. Thanks to our panelists.